Thank you. It's, it's an amazing honor to be here with this group of writers. And I am going to, well, this, my book is nonfiction, and the main character is named Daniel Ellsberg, and I'm going to pick a spot right in the middle of the story. He, to this point in his life, he's been a consummate insider. He was a Harvard PhD, a Marine officer, he worked for the Pentagon, and really was, though he's not famous, one of the early architects of the Vietnam War. But at this point, it's 1969, he's really turned against the war, ready to, possibly ready to do something big. And he has access to these top secret documents that reveal years, decades of government lies about the war. And I don't think it's um, too much of a spoiler to say he released them, he, he leaked them to the press, and that really became, and is to this day, really controversial what he did. But this is a little bit before that, and it's one of those little moments, I love these little moments, where life can change. Ellsberg stood on the sidewalk outside of Philadelphia courthouse, feeling like an absolute fool. In front of him marched a group of anti-war demonstrators. They were carrying signs, chanting slogans, passing out leaflets. Cast your whole vote, Ellsberg thought. Not a slip of paper merely, but your whole influence. He couldn't get the words out of his head. They were from Henry David Thoreau's famous essay, Civil Disobedience, written in 1849. Thoreau, to protest slavery and what he saw as America's unjust war in Mexico, had refused to pay taxes. He'd been arrested and jailed, but had no regrets. Cast your whole vote, your whole influence. It was an inspiring idea, but he still felt like a fool. Ellsberg had flown across the country to attend the War Resisters International Conference, held at a college near Philadelphia. He thought he'd be going to lectures and discussions, and instead everyone had trooped to the courthouse to demonstrate. Inside, an activist named Bob Eaton was being sentenced to prison for resisting the draft. Ellsberg had tried to think of an excuse to duck out. Could he say he was sick? And then do what? Hide in his room all weekend? His only previous peace march had been the one with Patricia in 1965. And he'd only gone to that one hoping for a date. He left. He felt the same fear now that he had then. What if his picture showed up in the newspaper? He could hear the mocking laughter of colleagues in Washington. But he knew how he felt about the war. He looked around. There were no TV cameras or reporters, no police in sight. People hurried past on their way to work, hardly seeming to notice the demonstrators. Ellsberg stepped out to join the rally. Why are we doing this, he thought at first. What am I doing here? It seemed preposterous a way to con confront the colossal power of the United States government. He watched the other protesters marching, waving signs. He picked up a stack of anti-war leaflets and held them out to people passing by. And suddenly, to his surprise, he began to enjoy himself. The threat of being cut off, of being thrust out from the club of insiders had always terrified Ellsberg. And the club had very definite rules. You could not have the confidence of powerful men and be trusted with their confidences if there was any prospect that you would challenge their policies in public, he later explained. It was the sacred code of the insider. He had lived by that code his entire life. This was the moment he crossed the line. He held out leaflets to people passing by. Most didn't take them. It didn't matter. I was no longer held in line by that fear, he said. I was about to become a dangerous person to know. The day after the courthouse demonstration, Ellsberg sat in the back row of a packed auditorium at the War Resisters Conference. A young activist named Randy Keeler stood in front of the group. Yesterday, our friend Bob went to jail, Keeler began. Last month, David Harris went to jail. Our friends Warren and John and Terry and many others are already in jail. Keeler stopped to clear his throat. From the back, Ellsberg could see the tears in the speaker's eyes. <clears throat> I'm not really as sad about it as I may seem, Keeler said. There's something really beautiful about it and I'm very excited that I'll be invited to join them soon. The audience knew that Keeler was facing jail time himself for refusing to cooperate with the draft. A few people began to clap, then a few more, then everyone stood and cheered. I can look forward to jail without any remorse or fear, Keeler continued, and that's because I know that everyone here and lots of people around the world, like you, will carry on. Everyone was clapping and cheering, many were crying. Ellsberg fell back into his seat, suddenly dizzy, short of breath. He had to get out, he needed space. He pushed out of the row and ran into the hall to the men's room. He turned on the light, stumbled to the far wall, slid down to the tile floor and sobbed. We're eating our young, he said to himself. These young men and women in the auditorium was just like the friends he had known in the Marines, patriots, fighting for their country. The best young Americans were going to war, or going to jail. What about his own son, Robert, now 13? Would the war still be raging in five years when Robert was draft age? Ellsberg sat on the floor. He could not stop shaking. Finally, gaining control, he took a few deep breaths. He stood and stepped to a sink and splashed water on his face. He looked at himself in the mirror. Now, he asked, what can I do to help end this war? Thanks.